So next up, we have uh, Professor Alex John Linden. Uh, he's the Clara West Professor of Ethics and Philosophy and Director of the Center for Ethics and Policy at Carnegie Mellon University. He's uh, one of the co-editors of one of the most used uh, uh, medical ethics uh, textbook. And he's published very widely and has done a lot of work uh, interna on international research ethics, uh, among other things. Uh, so Alex is going to talk about accountability in the use of AI in medicine. So I'm, I think I'm a slower thinker maybe than some of the other you know, um, you know, talks that we've seen. I, I'm a little bit more focused in a certain sense on what, what we're, we're doing here. You know, I, I mostly do ethical theory and I do research ethics. And um, you know, uh, part of the thing that worries me about some of the conversations we're having about yeah. ethics in AI is that we're, we, we act like AI is one thing. And, um, and we act like the decision-making context in which AI would be deployed are sort of uniform or one thing. You know, but like I work in research ethics with a little tiny, narrow cul-de-sac of the moral world. But even there, if you say, you know, there's a lot of statistical learning that goes on, um, you know, clinical trials, observational uh, studies, you know, lots of things. And if you said, well, you know, what do you think about, um, um, you know, placebo controls just in general? you know, or um, propensity score matching, like, you know, good or bad, you know, it wouldn't make any sense. You know, you'd say, well, I need to know a lot more about the, tr the problem that you're looking at, the problem you're trying to solve, and let's make sure that the methods are, are really calibrated to the, to the problem. And so in a certain sense, what I'm going to, my talk is going to be, you know, um, looking at some specific examples and, and asking whether some of the very general moral requirements that people are saying AI ought to live up to make sense in the particular problems that, that I'm looking at, or at least whether they make sense for the per particular problems in the way that their proponents um, think. So um, I have to start with, uh, I have nothing, no, no conflicts of interest to disclose. Um, I work for a, a university, everything I say uh, is just my responsibility and my fault. I am gonna mention some um, products in this, but that's not by way of endorsement um, uh, by any means. Um, so I want to first just talk about the moral background to the doctor-patient relationship, um, some of the pitfalls that are the problems that we want to worry about, um, in particular how dependence gives rise to particular concerns about accountability. Um, then I want to talk about explainability and the idea that that should be a requirement that we put um, on the use of AI systems in this context. And in particular, um, when we think about the many different roles that explainability uh, would play within that relationship, and then um, when I start to talk about the difference between explainability and verifiability, then that's going to lead me to, to say some things about how prediction, lar you know, very generally speaking, is really different from intervention. And so even then within this really relatively narrow cul-de-sac of things I'm talking about, um, uh, I think systems that try to give you a diagnosis or a categorization and systems that try to tell you what to do in the world should be regarded very, very differently. So um, when you have a need and asymmetric in, uh, knowledge, then that gives rise to a dependence on expertise. And now there's lots of cases in the world where you have a need and you have asymmetric knowledge, like I may need a new car uh, and I don't know that much about them. And when I go to buy one, it's caveat emptor, right? I mean, you know, the person who's selling me the car knows a lot more about it than I do, uh, but they have no special duty towards me. So if the, uh, if the need that you have, um, you know, is particularly significant, uh, then we might say, well, there's a social obligation now on the part of the people who have that knowledge to make sure that they're using that knowledge to minister to your particular interests, put your interests above those of third parties or, uh, uh, or uh, their own interests. And um, this is where now the, you know, um, Glenn can, can um, correct me, but, you know, the, um, these are the postulates from a uh, California law case, Cobbs versus Grant. Um, I don't want to read the whole thing because I'm worried about time, but just the, the last postulate here, that the patient being unlearned in medical sciences has an abject dependence upon and trust in his physician for the information upon which he relies during the decisional process, thus raising an obligation in the physician that transcends arm's length transactions. So this is the idea that uh, because of the importance of a health need and because of your reliance on the expert knowledge of the clinician, that you have a fiduciary, physician has a fiduciary uh, duty to minister to the needs of the patient above the physician's own interests or the interests of third parties. Now this, the worry then 
uh, is that opaque systems open the door to a kind of domination. So domination would effectively be that someone else gets to make decisions and influence your life on the basis of considerations that you don't necessarily share. That's a very general description. And so um, domination could take the form of backdoor paternalism. So the opacity of the decision making means the clinical care team can make decisions on your behalf get you to do what they want you to do, even if that's not necessarily what you would want to do. So they're restricting your liberty out of a concern for your best interests. And the other type of domination would be um, basically one where you're exploited, you're, you're, got, you're, you're uh, brought to make a choice so that it benefits some third party, the, the hospital system, um, uh, the physicians themselves, the corporations that make that system. So um, one of the questions then is, well, look, isn't ex is explainability a key to helping us avoid domination and ensuring accountability then in medicine? So Swarthout uh, is a good example um, of someone who thinks that the answer to that question is yes. He says, when you have expert consultations, among humans, the physician may question whether some factor was considered or what effect a particular finding had on a final outcome, and the expert is expected to be able to justify his answer and show that sound medical principles and knowledge were used to obtain it. In addition to providing a diagnosis or a prescription, so we've got these two things lumped together now, diagnosis and prescription, one's a classification, one's an intervention, a consultant program must be able to explain what it's doing and justify why it's doing it. Um, bound up in this as well is uh, what do we mean by an explanation? Um, so you have to justify what you're uh, recommending. And by justification, he goes on, we mean explanations that tell us why an expert system's actions are reasonable in terms of principles of the domain, the reasoning behind the system. And then if you go on to read the article, it's clear that he's talking about invoking causal knowledge about the features or, uh, of the system in that, or the features of the domain, d domain knowledge. So intuitively, this makes a great deal of sense. Um, explainability is an intervention that reduces asymmetries, because once you have to explain what you're doing, you're giving me the information uh, that's material to the choice that I, that I have to make. And so that promotes uh, uh, autonomy. And it exposes decision making to scrutiny uh, so that we can evaluate it. And that promotes accountability. So we can know when you explain your decision, we could say, ah, were you wrong? You didn't understand, you made a mistake somewhere, you had the wrong model, you had wrong facts, something like that. Or, nope, your recommendation uh, was exactly right, but it wasn't carried out well, there was faulty execution, something like that. Uh, or, nope, it, it was executed well, but the, the materials that we used, they were faulty. And so, you know, when you care about liability in, in large, complex divisions of labor, then this is the sort of thing you do. You have a, sur a fault surface, and you're, you're looking at where, where if, there, if there was a problem, wh where, wh what place on that fault surface was responsible for the adverse event. Now, I actually think uh, explainability can do all of the things. A bunch of things have been lumped together in what I was just talking about. And I think explainability can do all of those things in certain domains. So my friends down the hall at Carnegie Mellon, structural engineers, they live in a great world where um, when you build a bridge, for example, uh, you can ask all the things that I just said are basically true uh, for structural engineers because we know the equations that govern the, the, the functioning of that system. Uh, they can tell you what the properties of the you know, tensile strength of the steel, how soil composition affects, um, you know, the design properties of a bridge and use cases for the bridge. All those things, they have computational models where they can simulate out. They don't need to build 50 bridges and see which one is going to fall down. And if you say, well, wait a minute, why couldn't I have a span, you know, over, you know, that was this long? They can say, well, here's the load a span can bear. And so you have to have two spans or a span won't work. So, so for any question that you have, like, a, especially like a what if, well, what if we did that? They could say, well, here's what would happen. Happen, right? Uh, because we understand that causal system. So the interesting thing then is when you have these things, when you know the variables and you know the equations that govern their operation, there isn't a distinction between prediction and intervention. Intervention is just a counterfactual knowledge of the system. If I did this, this is what would happen. So if I can predict all states of the system, then I know what happens if I intervene in the system. 
And, you know, uh, structural engineers, that's, that's basically true. You could phrase it as intervention. You could phrase it as prediction. And largely the same thing is true for AlphaGo Zero. Um, it's an amazing accomplishment, but you have to think about the, 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 the things that go into making that possible. Uh, you know all of the variables, the spaces on the board, the arrangement of the pieces, the rules of the game. There's no uncertainty about those things. You tell it to optimize a particular utility function, and it can play hundreds of thousands or tens of millions of, uh, 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 of games, and then it can learn, basically, the strategic surface of that game. And so by, at this point now, you, know, um, you could say, well, what if I did this, and AlphaGo Zero is basically telling you, uh, uh, it can basically predict uh, um, strategic interactions because of the comprehensive knowledge of what that strategic surface looks like. Okay. Um, well, uh, okay, so, so let's break out now all the things that go together in this lovely package, right? So you, know, you have your expert, and you say, well, listen, what are you going to do to me? And so the expert can say, this is, tell you this is what I'm going to do to you. I'm going to give you, administer you this particular test, or I'm going to administer you this particular treatment, or so on. And um, when you say, well, why? Well, the explanation can appeal to um, a, a, a complex understanding of the, the, the parameters, the variables, the equations that govern their interactions in the space. And that can be used to predict, well, what's the effect going to be on the patient. So a bunch of things are lumped together here, right? Um, when we get an explanation in this kind of context, uh, we can know what the goals of the decision maker are. We can be, get insight into the workings of the, spe the, of the actual system that's conveyed to us, so our understanding not just of what the motivations of the decision maker are, but, but of how the system actually works, those are, con uh, are conveyed to us. And we get some warrant for the claim that this intervention is going to have a particular effect. Okay. We're now leaving the world where things make sense. <laughs> because now we're going to medicine. So in medicine, practical efficacy very frequently precedes the knowledge of why what we do works. So if you're a, tr a traditional computer scientist, if you're just, you know, my father's an engineer, when he gets sick, he's like, what are the Bernoulli equations that govern, you know, like how all these things work, you know, and I'm like, if we knew all that, Dad, you wouldn't, there wouldn't be any problem, right? Um, I'm going to just give you two examples from a laundry list, right? We have known for a century that you can cure people's headaches, that, a that aspirin is an analgesic, without knowing why. We don't know the mechanism by which it works, uh, and there was a, a lot of people working on understanding that. Lithium is a mood stabilizer. We've known that it had that effect for 50 years without knowing why it had that effect, the mechanism. So in medicine, very often we can say, what we're going to do, I'd like to give you lithium uh, to stabilize your mood. Why does it work? I, I, I don't know. I might be able to tell you a story, but don't think that that story is what is going to explain why I think it's going to have this effect on you. My, the warrant for my thinking that it's going to have this effect on you comes from the fact that when we give it to people, it tends to have this effect. But I can't tell you why. In medicine, a lot of our theories are unreliable. So um, tens of thousands of women, I don't know the actual number, um, uh, had radical mastectomies on the basis of the idea that if you have cancer in your breast uh, and we remove as much of the tissue as we can around the surrounding tumor, that that's going to reduce the probability of recurrence. That, that theory was really compelling and a lot of people acted on it and a lot of women had that procedure until it was shown to be false in a large scale clinical trial. Megadose vitamins, people really love these. They think they're going to have uh, anti-cancer effects. Um, they often fail. And in the CARAT trial, the people in the active arm, the people who got uh, the high doses of vitamins, had a higher rate of cancer than the people in the control arm. Uh, the acid theory of peptic ulcer disease, the, the medical community was c convinced that if you had peptic ulcer, it was because you had excess uh, acid in your stomach until a guy came around and said, it's H. pylori bacteria. Watch, I'll drink some. Look, I have a peptic ulcer. Um, we get rid of the bacteria, peptic ulcer goes away. Um, high dose chemotherapy for autologous band, uh, bone marrow trans and autologous bone marrow transplant for end stage breast cancer. This is another thing. It sort of got out before it was tested. People thought it was really going to work. Clinical trials showed it didn't work. The point is, in medicine, lots of people have lots of theories that, about uh, how things are going to work, 
and clinical trials are the slaughter bench of uh, people's plausible theories. So, um, and that's, that's true in a very literal sense. We have a very analytic uh, drug development system right now where theories of pathophysiology and, and um, drug mechanism drive drug development. And nine out of the 10 things that we try don't work on anything. They don't get approval for anything. Now, a bunch of those things get approved for things other than what we were trying them on. Latisse, if you suffer from the crippling disease of um, eyelashes that aren't sufficiently lush and full, um, you know, Latisse was not developed to, to give you more beautiful lashes. It was developed as a, as a, a, a drug to treat um, a particular eye disorder. I forget which, which one right now. I'm blanking on it. Um, Viagra also, um, you know, uh, n uh, approved as a medical intervention, not um, uh, initially tried for erectile dysfunction. Um, also, that summary statistic uh, doesn't represent the fact that a lot of drugs are Me Too drugs, and in other areas, nothing that we try works. So neuro neuroprotective agents for neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, nothing works. And even when you've spent hundreds of millions of dollars, quite literally, to bring your drug to phase three, 50% of the things that we try fail. So my point here is not to, is not to cast aspersions on medicine for not having the kind of knowledge that you know, my colleagues down the hall have. It's just to say, you know, when we start to ask for things like, tell me the theory on the basis of which you're doing this, remember that in medicine, the theory they're giving you may not be as reliable as the theory that the structural engineer has down the hall. So in spheres where causal knowledge is incomplete and piecemeal, the warrant for causal claims and assurances of accuracy and reliability has to be grounded in empirical testing. So um, that involves uh, aligning data and our methods for the decisions that we need to make, testing the robustness uh, of our models on alternative data sets so that we can winnow out things like um, performance of our, of our machine on the basis of arbitrary features of those data sets. But it also means, and if you're from Silicon Valley now, this is like the big 10,000 pound bomb in your, uh, on your parade, you still have to carry out prospective trials with meaningful endpoints against a standard of care. And there's a lot of people that don't like that idea because they're hoping AI is going to give us an end run around clinical trials. So I want to try to explain now some of these things in a little bit more detail. And um, you know, here I'm kind of airing now some, some grievances about um, you know, working in research ethics, I go to a lot of people who do a lot of really sophisticated things with clinical trial designs, and I say, listen, I'm basically enumerate. You know, I need you to explain this to me in American language. I'm a hayseed from Wyoming, you know, and people do a pretty good job at it. Um, uh, not so much in artificial intelligence, actually. And so the, if I get things wrong here now, and, I, and I'm happy to, uh, you know, for, for my colleagues to explain the mistakes I'm making, but I blame those mistakes on you. <laughs> So uh, I want to talk about um, this case that we heard about already, um, about the pneumonia example across the way at Pittsburgh, right? So because this is put forward as illustrating the need for explainability uh, as a moral requirement in medicine. Uh, so you know, here the idea is that the most accurate system was opaque. The rule-based, simple rule-based system that wasn't as accurate was transparent. And that allowed them to say, listen, if you're asthmatic, like, that's bad. Like, if you have asthma and you come in with pneumonia, that's bad. And yet the system is saying that it's not bad. And so now, you know, if it wasn't transparent, we wouldn't be able to go in and tweak that parameter. But because, you know, in a, in a transparent system, we can go in, we can tweak that parameter. Um, uh, and, um, you know, that's a good thing. So, um, so that, that's basically just what I said. You know, we should prefer, some people say we should prefer simpler models for this reason. And the question I want to ask now, because I'm slow, it's hard for me to go quickly through these things. Did um, adjusting that system improve it? It's not clear to me that it did. And in fact, it makes me worry that it just leads us to use that system to do things it was never designed to do. So let's go slowly. Probability of death from pneumonia, right? It goes from zero to one. And here we have patients that have a vector of properties. So um, uh, you've got pneumonia, you've got properties A, B through N, 
and then some people, some patients have asthma, and so the longer line is supposed, so the, the line here is supposed to be an individual, right? So the short line is an individual that has pneumonia, and this vector of properties, the longer line is an individual that has pneumonia, that vector of properties, and asthma, right? And then the idea is supposed to be something like this. Well, our expectation is that if you have asthma, then you have a higher probability of death uh, than if you don't have asthma. And what we see in the model is that, whoa, wait, the model is telling us that if you have asthma, you have a lower probability of death than if you don't. Model is wrong. But that's not what's really going on. The model is telling us the probability that you're going to die given all of the stuff we did to you in the clinic, right? Because the data is all actuarial data about people came in, we gave them this, we did this to them. Now, if you've only recorded these, these, this set of treatments, right, then this could still be puzzling to you because you're like, well, if the treatments are the same and the properties of the patients are the same but for asthma and asthma makes you worse, then you should be doing worse if you have asthma. And the truth is, that there was other care that we didn't record that the asthmatics were getting. So there was a variable that we didn't record that explains the actuarially correct uh, judgment that those people actually did better than the people without asthma. That's a fact. And the system couldn't explain why because there were unmeasured variables in the system. And now the truth is, if you look at those studies, they didn't have that many variables that they were measuring. And so there's probably lots of other features of people that we didn't even realize, because we weren't really ca you know, uh, breaking out subgroups by these other features. There's other features of people that we didn't realize that correlate with other aspects of care and that would modulate people's pre uh, you know, performance uh, on these different measures anyway. So um, what does this tell us? Well. The idea now that labeling that system as biased, I think, is a mistake. If I could eliminate two words from the debate about in ethics and AI, it would be bias and explainability because they are catch-alls that everything is put into. Just tell me your specific concern without using the term bias or explainability. So here, right, the question that had been verified in testing when we said, is this an accurate algorithm, was something like probability of death given asthma and current practice, or more generally, probability of death given a measured variable and current practice, or current practice is a catch-all because you didn't measure every single aspect of current practice. And that system is actuarially, like those, those judgments, those probabilities are actuarially correct those are the things the system was designed to be able to give you as outputs. And that can be useful information because if you say, hey, what of our populations are we serving well? You would say, actually, we're serving our asthmatics pretty well. They come in, we know they're at high risk, we put them in the ICU. They do better than our other very sick but not quite as sick patients that we don't give quite as intensive treatment to. The limitation now, though, like many medical tests, this system can't tell you what to do. It can't tell you where to move your medical resources, right? how to reposition them, because that's not what you ever asked it to do. Yet the idea that this system is biased is predicated on the idea that the questions that we wanted to know was something like probability of death given no treatment, or probability of death given some treatment that isn't the standard of care. But now that's a counterfactual. And the data wasn't sufficient to answer that counterfactual. And the accuracy of the system was never verified on answering those counterfactuals. Right? It was just verified on, on those actuarial claims. So my worry now is that there's a danger in, that, in being able to look under the hood of the simpler system because it let us think we made it better when all it did was it let us think we can use this system to answer a question it wasn't designed or validated to answer. So now I want to go into, um, uh, I want to draw a contrast. Uh, I'm, this is sort of going a little bit deeper now into this very, you know, this sort of simple case. Um, in purely predictive systems, non-causal correlations, can, uh, if they are equal, uh, ecologically valid, then they can help us make very accurate decisions. And one of the strengths of machine learning is it can leverage 
large sets of data where there might be ecologically valid correlations that don't tell you anything about causation to make highly accurate predictions. So you know, if you, if people have yellow fingers and some other properties may be at very high risk of lung cancer. Uh, and people who have bumps, you know, uh, red bumps on their skin and some like a fever and some other things, they have very high uh, probability of having chicken pox. And the challenge in these systems is to design them so that conditional probabilities that are necessary to replicate their performance in deployment are maintained in deployment. So you have to know what are the things that we need to make sure stay stable so that the ecological validity of the correlations we used in our training get replicated out in the field, right? So I think that's how we have to think about systems um, um, like uh, the diabetic, uh, those in diabetic retinopathy. But even here, there are important differences, right? So um, um, IDXDR, uh, which was already, rec already mentioned, this is this FDA-approved software. It's the first standalone software for making a screening decision without an expert for diagnosing more than mild diabetic retinopathy. Um, it's actually a kind of a hybrid system because it uses the convolutional neural networks to detect very specific pathologies that clinicians recognize as important diagnostic markers, uh, hemorrhages, exudates, lesions of various kinds, and then it uses a model that uses, relies on expert knowledge to, to give you, to go from detection of those pathologies to an output label. It's different from what DeepMind is doing uh, with their approach, which is let's just take uh, the image uh, that's labeled, let's put it into the, the, the classifier and uh, train it up and uh, on hundreds of thousands of images and let it use whatever information is present in the image of the retina. And so in one of their papers, their JAMA paper, they say another fundamental limitation of their system arises from the nature of deep networks in which the neural network was provided with only the image and the associated grade without explicit definition of features because the network learned the features that were most predictive for referability implicitly, that is to say it learned the things that uh, uh, gave it the most accurate model for pr predicting the label. Um, it's possible that the algorithm is using features previously unknown to or ignored by humans. So now in this case, in these cases, I think that understanding the AI's model is not necessary for accountability. What is necessary for accountability is explaining why this test was indicated. Why was this the best test? So how did we validate it? How does it fare relative to the best alternative? Were the conditions of testing comparable to those that were necessary to achieve its accuracy? In medicine, we do these things all the time. If you don't have very high quality control in your genetics laboratory, you will get the genome of a lab technician or somebody else who handled your equipment. Were the staff adequately trained? And so on. So here, for these kinds of diagnostic systems, the warrant for accuracy comes from empirical testing. And the warrant for clinical use comes from their superior accuracy to alternative methods. So I'm fine, you explain what you're going to do, and that the warrant comes from um, the validation uh, in, in empirical testing, even though you don't know, you can't access the model, and so you don't know what the system is doing or why it's doing what it's doing. And, and as it turns out, for diabetic retinopathy, you know, the sensitivity of IDXDR um, well, so uh, in previous studies of humans, it ranged from 33, 34, up to 73 percent. So already, there's a huge difference, right? Orders of magnitude between 33 and, and 73. So we don't really know how, um, how sensitive, uh, you know, humans are. Plus, there's what's the best human do versus what does your clinician actually do? Um, and IDXDR was about 87 percent sensitive. And the FDA had said, look, 85 percent, if you can meet that, then we'll say you're superior. So I would say, look, you know, um, we can use this test. Um, as long as we use it within the confines that it's been validated, it's likely to be 87% cent, 87 uh, likely to detect your diabetic retinopathy if you actually have it, um, which is superior to a human. Uh, but we don't know how it works. That doesn't bother me. Now I want to talk about interventional systems, though, because I think this is an important contrast, right? 
Non-causal correlations don't support intervention, and I think that's really what was going on in the pneumonia case. Cleaning yellow fingers is not going to help your cancer. Treating your yellow bumps may actually relieve some of your symptoms, but it's not going to kill the virus that's causing the chickenpox. Electronic medical records are often confounded and incomplete. I mean, the people who like the clinicians, we have clinicians, right? They're a mess, <laughs> right? EMRs uh, are a mess. Uh, and so now the challenge is you can easily generate hypotheses, but validating their efficacy in the real world requires uh, clinical trials. And so I want to talk about this other specific case, um, which surrounds sepsis, mostly because this is a, a case involving, you know, so AlphaGo is this, you know, this uh, AlphaGo Zero anyway, this tremendous accomplishment with reinforcement learning. And so it's like, man, you know, if you can beat the world's, you know, the, the world's experts and all the other AIs, you know, and now we're going to use reinforcement learning in medicine, shit, you know, it's going to be the best doctor, uh, you know, that there ever was. So let's sick this on sepsis, right? So sepsis is a life-threatening organ dysfunction caused by dysregulated host response. You basically get a blood infection and the body starts to attack its own organs. It's a leading cause of death worldwide. In fact, it accounted for about $20 billion in uh, healthcare spending in the United States in 2011. That's one-fifth of um, uh, healthcare spending in the United States, if you believe that statistic. Um, there's a wide variety of care that's provided to patients who have sepsis because there's so much uncertainty about the models that link disease pathophysiology, clinical presentation, and the interventions that we use. There's just a lot we don't know. We don't know a lot about why the host function, you know, why the body starts to attack itself, what primes those things. And then also, this is a messy clinical presentation. So it's very difficult to know. You, you do something, you, you administer care. It's difficult to know, did you extend that person's life or did you shorten that person's life? Because it's hard to know, well, what's the, like, counterfactually, what would have happened to that person if I didn't do what I did? So um, uh, Komarkowski and colleagues have this off-policy reinforcement learning to construct a model of optimal ses uh, sepsis care. This is not prediction now. This is we want to we make a recommendation to you about uh, how to intervene. I'm not going to go through the nitty gritty of the details, probably because it's outside of you know, my own expertise really take you through it. Um, but the main thing I want to say is when I saw reinforcement learning, I thought, oh, it's learning from experience. Like, this is great, right? I mean, that's how AlphaGo Zero mastered uh, the game. It learned by experience. This isn't learning by experience. It's just another technique for mining a large fixed database. And it has a lot of issues because you take this giant database, hundreds of thousands, actually about 100,000 uh, people, you have to now cat make, you know, draw, oops, you, um, you have to draw categories. You have to say, well, you know, um, first of all, what's the reward? So how are we going to optimize good performance? So they chose survival, but you know, you could choose, you have a choice now what proxies you're going to use for system performance. Um, now you have to discretize a whole bunch of things that are, you know, not necessarily discrete. So how, who gets the same treatment? You know, because you're talking about vasopressors and, and fluids, and those go in, you know, in, in, in um, you know, um, linear amounts. And so, you know, who gets the, the, you know, the same thing? So how you bin those things, that can matter, and so on. But basically, you know, you do those things, you, you, you train the system, and then you test it again on another fixed data set against um, uh, the, um, the treatments that were actually made by clinicians. Right, and this is interventional. They say, we envision this system would be used in real time, patient data obtained from different streams, being fed into electronic health record software, fitted with our algorithm, which would suggest a course of action. Um, you know, so, so in the background here, my concern is, okay, so here's a thing that was effectively trying to do what, in a sort of sense, Watson Oncology was trying to do. Um, and uh, as the slide that um, we saw earlier showed, I think that's largely regarded as a failure, so we have to be careful. Uh, 
I just want to raise a couple of concerns uh, about this because, you know, as an ethicist, in, you know, uncertainty is really important. And so you might say, well, look, if this thing has seen 100,000 patients, I mean, there aren't that many um, uh, physicians who've seen 100,000 patients with sepsis. So um, it, how do, hasn't it just eliminated uncertainty if it's performed these complex statistical operations on all this data and it says this is the optimal treatment? Well, one thing is that, um, and by the way, there's this paper by Gottesman and colleagues I highly recommend. It's a tour de force in terms of being able to explain very difficult things to people who don't have the sort of technical chops that the authors of that paper clearly do. Um, but, you know, the, the, the data here is really um, sparse in time, which means you make a lot of decisions about how to care for these patients before you measure the, the, when you play a video game, right, at the top you get a score whether you killed enough of the aliens, right? And reinforcement learning is basically there's got to be something at the top that's moving, that's giving you your score. Well, you only get that score uh, when the patient survives or doesn't at seven weeks or 14 weeks or whatever. Well, you've made a lot of decisions in the meantime. And so you're comparing whole vectors of decisions. You're not getting discrete feedback. It's not like when you're trying to maintain someone's blood pressure or something like that, you know, uh, and you can you know, intervene and get a real-time feedback from how different interventions might have behaved. There's also a lot of common causes, a lot of collinearities in this data. The sickest patients are not gonna receive no care. And the, the, less, the least sick patients are often not going to receive the most aggressive care. So there's going to be a lot of things that it's going to be difficult for you to tease apart. And this is another moral. Um, you can have as much data as you want here, but if it doesn't have the diversity that you need for these statistical operations to do what they're supposed to do, you're not going to be able, it's not, you're not going to be able to wizard it out of the data. Also, confounding isn't con controlled. And we don't know what the relevant variables are in this system. So that, that, I guess, would be the ultimate thing I would just keep coming back to, right? In lots of other places, if you're Amazon and you want to know what leads people to order a book, you know, you can probably be pretty confident that the data that you have from their book ordering is relevant to their decision. In medicine, you, there could be entirely um, a whole, uh, you, there could be entire features of the ecosystem of this disease that you didn't realize and you didn't record in your data. So this is just an example. You have a positive correlation between treatment and adherence, but a negative out that 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 corresponds to a negative uh, outcome. And so you might think, wow, the most adherent patients, or the patients who got say the most intensive treatment, if you want to do it that way, you know, they had the worst outcome. So wow, that leads me to think that the treatment really doesn't work. Yeah, unless disease severity is a common cause of getting the treatment uh, of adherence and your outcome, right? I wish it can be in the situation where you are the most adherent when you realize you're in trouble, that it's not a joke anymore, and so you stick to your treatment regimen very carefully. And in that situation, the most sick patients are the most likely to die, and so your intervention could be highly effective. You just don't know it. Well, those things are going to be pervasive in this kind of data. So um, without a causal model, intervention is not classification. The outputs that you get are hypotheses. And verification of those hypotheses will require uh, a randomized control trial. And to their credit, Komarkowski and colleagues say this work will require you know, uh, prospective validation. So I don't mean to be picking on them as they are not people who say, yes, this is ready to go in, into the clinic, to their credit. Um, now, I think explainability can play an important role here. It's just different than what people think. When hypotheses are supported, like you, you run this thing, you say this looks like it's going to be good, then you try it out and it turns out it was, then understanding the model that generated those hypotheses might shed light on or help you to better understand uh, important causal relationships. So explanation now can be valuable as a guide to the researcher, right? It's not that um, we are being, we are already able to understand that. It's that when we say, hey, uh, this thing worked the way that we thought, um, what, what does that tell us about what the model, un the underlying model might actually be? And now maybe we can refine the interventions that we do to winnow out possible conjectures about what that model space actually looks like. I think that has important implications for things like learning healthcare systems. Uh, where we want to be, we want to do more to learn from the data that we have, learn more efficiently uh, from the data that we have. But I just want to leave you with this downer. All machine learning techniques that we have are purely associationist. So in the examples I gave you, the, the, the concerns that we have about those, they're going to appear in all the machine learning techniques that 
uh, or I'd say the vast majority of them, there are people who care about causality. Uh, medical uncertainty is deep and pervasive, and I think if you are a machine learning person here and you want to work in this area, I really encourage you to learn a lot about medicine and reversals uh, and the way that people have changed their mind about things so that you understand the incompleteness of the domain in which you're working. I do think that, that we are on the cusp of really great uh, strides in um, AI improving diagnosis uh, in the near term, um, but I don't think that our current approaches obviate the need for uh, clinical trials. Um, and a separate line of work for me is then the opportunity to, uh, for learning healthcare systems to integrate um, artificial intelligence systems into novel, you know, uh, randomized controlled trial designs that are nimble, that are ongoing through the course of care, um, that use things like outcome adaptation, and that are actually real lear reinforcement learners, where you actually are learning from real experience uh, in the clinic. So um, uh, my conclusions are, I think I want I'm, to go all the way back to the very beginning. I don't like blanket claims that explainability is a, is a moral necessity. I don't think it's a panacea. I think verification can be more important for clinical utility than explanation in the kinds of concrete cases I was talking about. I think accountability in medicine depends on very careful empirical validation of AI systems in prospective studies, and that learning healthcare systems uh, need systems of verification to hold stakeholders accountable and your ability to say why you think something is going to happen isn't sufficient. Theory isn't sufficient. We need to trust but validate. Thanks.